Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I'm here with Dustin Quick of the Holy Smokes Catholic Podcast. Um, and today, I don't have just Dustin with me. Whoops. <laughs> so my cat was with me, and then he just jumped off. And so too bad. I guess nobody's going to see the cat today. But anyway, <laughs> Dustin, it's good to see you. I showed you Sebastian uh, right before we started. And so I guess he knew that the interview was starting, and so he knew he had to go. But uh Dustin, it's good to see you, my friend. Uh, was it I was on your podcast before? Tell me what's been going on with your life. Uh, well, brother, uh, again, uh, before I start, I just want to thank you and give all praise and honor and glory to the Most Holy Trinity and uh, thank him for the gift of his holy Catholic divine faith and church, uh, the instrument of salvation for the redemption of man and the cosmos, which I'm so grateful to be a part of uh, through his mercy and grace. And yeah, we had a, a conversation on my podcast, um, Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism and Conversation. So that's uh, that's what this is doing here. It's my mm -hmm. little calling card. Um, and we talked about your conversion and also some stuff related to the papacy, if I yep. remember. Um, so what's been going on with me? Uh, well, this July marks the one year anniversary of my podcast. And how I started was basically, um, I have a passion for what's, what's called temple theology. And what I'd come to discover in my reversion to the Catholic faith was that far from Catholicism being a hodgepodge or syncretism between this pure Semitic monotheism and Greco-Roman paganism. In fact, Catholicism represents the fullness of the oldest strand of temple biblical religion. So it both restores and fulfills Solomon's temple. And so that was the driving thrust to start my podcast was I wanted to show this continuity, this fulfillment, but also um, I wanted to touch on issues of apologetics and spirituality, contemporary church issues, and that sort of a thing. And just, just bringing uh, depth and balance, you know, as much as possible within my abilities and limits and his grace to the conversation. And thus far, um, I've been blessed to have as guests in just the span of a year. And again, I, I still have a tiny, tiny operation. I have like 420 subscribers, but um, be that as it may, I've been blessed to have such guests as Jimmy Aiken, Tim Staples, uh, Margaret Barker, who's the foundress of Temple Theology, uh, Rachel Fulton Brown, uh, Scott Hahn is going to be on my podcast on August 17th. Um, I've had yourself, Eric Ibarra, Michael Lofton of Reason and Theology, Elijah Yassi, William Albrecht, names like these, people that I genuinely admire and look up to. Never did I think I'd be having conversations with them about things that matter most to us and to me but here we are so uh, that's what's been going on with me and aside from that I am married I am um, I just turned 38 years old so I'm no spring chicken getting up there uh, got three kids three small little girls and a Sharpay puppy so yeah life is uh, it's pretty hectic right now but it's but it's awesome and I wouldn't uh, change it for anything well, that's beautiful, Dustin. And so um, one place I would like to begin is just by talking about, let's start with your childhood, right? So mm -hmm. today we're going to talk about your conversion and you have a very interesting conversion story because uh, usually, you know, someone goes from one thing to another thing, right? <laughs> but yeah. you went from one thing to another thing to another thing. Like, so you have a very intimate knowledge, I'd say, of what conversion means and what it's like to go through that process, right? Because you've, you've gone through it multiple times. And so let's start off with just um, you're when you were a baby, right? So tell me, what, uh, were you raised in a Catholic family? What was going on there? All right. So as far as my early childhood, uh, starting with infancy, not that I remember much, but um, so my mother's side is Catholic. My father's side is, you know, Pentecostal, evangelical. Um, my, my dad's dad was a pastor and his wife, my grandma, who's still alive, um, was basically assisted him. And she, she was involved in ministry as well. So that's the dad, my dad's side of the family. My mom's side is Catholic. Um, 
so as a baby, I was baptized into the Catholic Church um, because that's what my mom's mom, my grandma Mary, funny enough, her name's Mary, um, wanted me baptized in the church. She wanted to make sure that that was done. And so it was. Um, however, I never received um, confirmation or first communion. I, I wasn't raised Catholic. However, I did receive a Catholic baptism. Uh, growing up, I, again, most of my uh, experience with Christianity was, was from my dad's side. Because my, my grandmother in particular, uh, God bless her, to this day, you know, uh, one of the people that has the strongest faith I've ever seen, the greatest prayer life, her Bible is just so torn to tatters. I mean, when I look at her, I see somebody like the definition of somebody who follows Christ, even though she's outside of the visible bounds of the one true church. Um, again, we're only judged off of what we know. Um, and she is this wonderful person. So she's, she, from very early on, she instilled um, a, a Christ consciousness within me and how important that was. However, um, speaking of conversion, this is something that we need to, we need to take hold of. We need to nurture. It's not something that happens by osmosis or just automatically, right? So as for me growing up in, uh, in Canada, you know, like anywhere in the States, um, I was a nominal Christian. If somebody were to ask me uh, what my faith was, I would, of course, say I'm a Christian. I don't believe in labels or denominations. I'm just, you know, a Christian. And um, I wore a cross around my neck. And uh, my main connection with God was when I was, you know, in a difficult situation in a jam or there was this, you know, a bad storm coming and I, I was afraid there was going to be a tornado. So I, I would pray or something like this. Right. It was it was majority in that context. Um, so that was my early life, but, uh, just again, to reemphasize, I had a very strong, uh, Christian influence from my grandmother on my dad's side. And now that I think of it, uh, looking back, uh, my grandmother, Mary on my mother's side, she didn't really talk about her Catholic faith per se that I can remember. Um, but looking back, I didn't really appreciate it at the time when I was younger, but looking back, the closest thing to a living saint, I mean, so selfless, so um, sacrificial, drop anything and any, you know, for her family to, to lay down her life. She literally did this. Um, she was like a second mother to me. And, and now I, I, I'm convinced that her intercession and again, her name is Mary, so it's very fitting. Her intercession, I think, was was one of the secondary means that God used to bring me back home, full circle into the church. So that that was my, you know, the, my early years from an infancy to, you know, I would say, like teenage ish years, mm -hmm. very early, yeah, getting getting to the upper teens, like eighteen, nineteen. That's how it was, pretty much, just like a nominal Christian. Right. So your your mom is Catholic, but your dad is basically Protestant. And so, you know, you were baptized as a baby, but it was more to accommodate your mother's side of the family. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then as right. you're growing up, um, kind of, I guess you're well, you know, your, your father's faith kind of becomes yours in a way. Right. So you're you're raised up in a Protestant household. I mean, did your mother ever want you to go to mass? Did she ever take you or was she kind of did she kind of just accept that, you know, your dad's the leader of the house, right? And so he gets to decide where you go to church and so on and so forth. The latter. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, to, to this day, my, you know, my, my mom, I don't want to say follows my dad, like not in the sense of, you know, blindly, but, right, but yeah. she's, she's adopted kind of his, his journey. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I can understand that, right? Um, with the husband being the spiritual head of the home, it, probably follows 99% of the time that the wife follows the husband, right? right yeah. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's just kind of how it goes. And that's not to say my mother's uh, faith is not sincere, or, right, yeah. or really what my dad holds, it certainly is. But but yeah, they, she ended up going the route that my dad and his side of the family went. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So now we're like, what, you're 19 years old in the story. Tell me what happens next. So <laughs> we're going yes. to the college years, right? Uh, or university. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So so this is when stuff gets really interesting, right? <laughs> so I was into I was into hip hop big. And I used to listen to uh, like Wu Tang, um, you know, stuff that you would call conscious hip hop, like not not like the mindless, I'm gonna, you know, slang all these drugs and shoot as many people as I can, but but the, the conscious stuff, um, the spiritual stuff, stuff that makes you think. And so I remember hearing a song by this one artist, Kill a Priest, it was called, it was an acronym, Bible, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. This is off of uh, Jizz's Liquid Swords album um, in 1995. So I'm listening to it and I'm hearing these words the white image of Christ, like something about Israeli Caesar Borgia and uh, the second son of Pope Alexander, the sixth of Rome. And what, you know, and what's the picture was shown. That's how the devils trick my dome, stuff like that. So I'm thinking, okay, everywhere I go, there's white images of Christ, right? And uh, how could this be? He lived in the Middle East, you know, and this whole, this whole division between the Middle East and Africa, this is modern topography based off of divide and conquer of, of colonial nations, of Western nations dividing up the continent. So I'm thinking, well, why do pictures look like this? Why does, I mean, Eden is supposed to be, in, you know, in Africa. Why do Adam and Eve look like this? I mean, something, something's not right. This is how, this was my thinking at the time. So uh, in that vein, I started thinking that the whole Christian operation, um, and you could probably see where I'm going with this, is sort of a, a, a sham. You, you pull the wool over people's eyes, you, you go into these darker places, these darker continents, and you present a God that looks like you, the slave master. And so just as you would obey that God, you would obey his emissaries that look like him. Mm -hmm. And this is a way to pacify and keep people down yeah so yeah, this was so, my thinking so yeah. in other words you kind of you got woke in college right i like, got uh, in i university. got super woke yeah <laughs> i got super woke and so i was looking into uh at this time it was like the black hebrew israelite movement and it's interesting because i'm caucasian right but i'm i'm thinking well the truth is so powerful and again speaking to the theme of conversion i don't care what i how uncomfortable it is I want to go where the truth is, no matter what it costs me, no matter if I feel out of place or whatever, whatever discomfort I have to endure, it's worth it. So this is this kind of mindset of conversion, even though I, I was missing the target, that mindset was with me. Um, and so I started abstaining from pork because, you know, I'm like, I'm thinking the as the black Hebrews taught the, the Levitical laws are still binding. So I would, I would stop eating pork and this kind of thing. And then I got into Islam, but how that happened again was, was the, the black power angle. It wasn't just straight up Arab Sunni Islam. Um, I, listened to a lecture by Malcolm X and Warith Dean Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad's son. It was, uh, it was actually recorded on a Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve in the 1950s. And, you know, they started talking about who the original people of the planet are, black and brown people, white people are nowhere in sight. And they start talking, and th that's already resonating with me because I'm, I've already, I've already imbibed that. I've already accepted that fact. Um, and so I started thinking about, well, if, if the black man is the original man, what is his original religion? Because if I can find what the original religion of the original people is, then that's where I need to be. This is what I was thinking. And so they broke down the etymology of the word Islam. They said it's submission. Uh, and peace. So by submitting to the one true God, you're in a state of wholeness, in a state of peace. And a, mus a Muslim, Mu, the one doing, Silm or Salam, Muslam, Muslim, 
is one who submits. So I'm like, all right, that makes sense because this predates any tribe, any person, any historical place. And it even applies to the creation itself, the stars, the sun, the moon, the trees, the atoms, they all submit to God. So in a, in a strange way, they're Muslim. Creation is Muslim. The, the natural religion of the universe is Islam. This is, a, this is my trajectory now. So I'm thinking, okay, makes sense. Um, I had to go get a Quran. So I visited a professor who taught the history of Western religions at my university. And I said, I want to read this thing. So I get a copy. I'm reading, I'm reading the translate, the English translation, obviously. And I see things that look very familiar to me. I see Abraham, Moses, you know, uh, Isaac, Jacob, all the, all the patriarchs, all the prophets are mentioned and there's similar stories. Some stories are the same, but I'm like, wow, this makes sense. And I, I would read it side by side with my Bible and I didn't really see, excuse me, any difference. This is too, obviously an impressionable, untrained mind. So I ended up connecting with somebody on campus who was a Romanian convert to Islam because people said, you know, you need to get in touch with somebody who looks like you so that you can know that Islam is not this strange foreign thing, but it's for everybody, including people who look like me. Right. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll meet up with them. So I did. And over the course of some sessions, we, we had some talks and he kind of broke down the faith to me. You know, Islam, submission to the one God, uh, five daily prayers, look at the Bible, they prostrated on their face, they prayed on their face, they prayed towards the east, they fasted. Um, you know, the, basically the Islamic rituals are in the Bible, Jesus prayed on his face. So I'm like, yeah, man, like this, this is it, like, this makes so much sense. And all the all the pieces were lining up for me. Except the issue of Christ. Because uh, as you may know, and many of your viewers probably do, that in Islam, Jesus or Isa is a prophet of Allah, of God, and he's the Messiah. He's called a word from God and his spirit. So all these curious titles, but the Quran doesn't ascribe to him divinity. It polemicizes against the Trinity. But interestingly enough, the Trinity that it speaks about is Allah, Jesus, and Mary. But Christians never held that, and we don't hold that, so I don't quite. And to this day, I've never been able to find the so-called sect. I, I've never been able to historically verify it. It's not even the Coloridians. The Coloridians didn't even believe that, so I, I don't know where that comes from. But that aside, um, there was the issue of the crucifixion where the guy told me, you know, it wasn't really Jesus who was crucified. Uh, Judas was made to look like him and G Judas suffered that fate. Um, God would never allow his prophet, his chosen one to be humiliated in a, in a death like that. So, so I'm like, okay. And then you get into the whole thing about Paul being the arch heretic, the arch deceiver who comes in with his, with his syncretism of uh, Judaism with this Christ, this Christ fellow who would later be elevated to a divinity by Emperor Constantine. And then at the Council of Nicaea, all these books were banned from the Bible, all this stuff, you know, all this, all the original Christian documents that would have proved the Islamic conception of Jesus in relation to God. These were all burned and buried and the, the original followers were stamped out. And so you had all these centuries, these, you know, whatever, how many centuries of, of error where Christians believe that, that Jesus was, was, uh, uh, you know, part of a trinity, and he's God, and he was crucified for our sins, and he made atonement for our sins, and then here comes Muhammad, the final prophet, the seal of the prophets, the, the final messenger until the day of judgment, and he's calling people back to the one true faith. This stuff you Christians believe about Jesus is false. Uh, you'll find me in your Torah and your gospel prophesied. You better submit to me, because if you submit to me, you submit to Allah, and to deny me is to deny Allah, and you'll be the losers on the day of resurrection. So that that's basically the, the message. And funny enough, uh, Muslims believe that Christ will return. 
he will descend on the wings of two angels in Damascus, Syria, and he will perform the Hajj, the the, the pilgrimage, and make tawaf around the Kaaba and and live as the Islamic caliph and establish Islam on earth and break the cross and kill the kill the pig and and abolish the jizya tax. So this is what uh, this is the eschatology part of the uh, Islamic eschatology. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, you know what? My thinking was, hey, 99% of this stuff makes sense. Mm -hmm. This Jesus thing isn't really sitting right. But I mean, if all this other stuff is true, I got to be wrong on the Jesus thing. And I'll just I'll just submit my intellect and, you know, give myself to this to this undertaking. And so I ended up taking the Shahada in mm -hmm. uh, 2006, I believe, which the Shahada is just saying, you bear witness that there's no God, but Allah, the one true God and Muhammad is his, uh, his messenger. Um, and that was it. And so I went home and I told my mom, Oof. <laughs> what was that like? Yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, it broke her heart. She was, she was very sad, but it wasn't so much her that I was concerned about. It was my father because even to this day i have a healthy fear even though i'm almost 40 years old i have a healthy fear and respect for my father so i was i was scared of him um and and i i don't remember when i when i initially told him i i kind of it was probably so traumatic i probably blocked it out of my subconscious like i don't even remember what that was like but I didn't get kicked out of the house. Uh, it was nothing like that. So basically, when it, when it came time to make the salah, make the prayers, I would just go in my room, be quiet about it, uh, hide the Quran under my bed or under my pillow, and stuff like that. And so, so how long were you Muslim, um, Dustin? So this is obviously this begins in uh, in university, right? Yeah. And then. Did, did it persist after university or did you just like, when, when does the next major change happen? You know? Yeah. So, uh, when I, when I first entered Islam, although I did have sympathies for the nation of Islam. Right. Yeah. The, Cause the I was thinking that you would join mm -hmm. that group, right? Because mm -hmm. of what you were saying initially, but so. To, yeah. 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 So I, I, even though I had sympathies for them, I, I couldn't accept certain things. I mean, they believe that Farad Muhammad is right. the Messiah and, you know, he's, he's God in person. Um, really? They don't, they don't believe in life after death. Uh, you know, they believe that the angels are, you know, the, the, the council of the gods, the angels will, will destroy the wicked civilization via UFOs. So the UFOs that we see are really uh, the black gods, the black men who are gods, who that's how they, that's how they get around. They're the, they're the angels, right? Uh, flying these, hovercraft yeah, so okay. stuff stuff like this i, I just couldn't I, I couldn't get on board with that so i'm like uh, i might as well just go to mainstream islam what you yeah. know sunni islam whatever so start going to the mosque and and that whole thing but the next major the next major change so by this by this time my conception of god is basically uh, what you would call a monad so it's just like one being supreme over the heavens and the earth, incomprehensible, indescribable, and so on. No likeness, no images, right? None, none of that stuff. But I got in, I, I stumbled upon this YouTube lecture. And this would have been about, ooh, I want to say 20, 2011, I don't even remember. Man, it's such a blur, but that's not important, really. So it was the Bible, the Quran, and the secret of the black God. So here we go again. I'm finding out new information, crucial information from the nation of Islam again. And it's going to majorly shift the, the, the subsequent steps in my journey in, in fundamental ways. So uh, this presenter's sort of thesis is that the God of the philosophers, which ultimately came to dominate Jewish, Christian, and Muslim discourse, is not the God of the Bible, and it's not the God of the Quran either. 
and he goes on to show how you know in the old testament how god appears in the form of a man how in early islamic tradition despite polemics today um there was a big thing in the ninth century from ahmed ibn hanbal and the hanbali school is one of the major schools of thought uh one of the big traditions for that school was um uh, the, uh, there was a hadith that said uh, Allah made Adam in his image uh, God made Adam in his image and so this was connected to another tradition in which Muhammad supposedly experiences a theophany akin to something that you would read in the Hebrew scriptures where God comes to him in the form of a, a shab, a youth so about 30 to 33 years old and he puts his hand on his chest and he reveals something to him. So I'm thinking, oh, well, that's interesting because number one, uh, Islamic apologetics tells me that God can never appear in this fashion. But uh, here we have, you know, historical data stipulating otherwise. And two, well, if this is in the vein of the Hebrew scriptures, then I need to go back and read my Bible and have more of an appreciation for my Bible again. The New Testament stuff, I'm going to I'm gonna put that on the back burner, but at least I know that the, that the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament is reliable to, a, to a, a large extent, right? Because the Islamic apologetic is that the Quran came precisely because Jews and Christians altered their scriptures. The original meaning was lost or obscured. And so the Quran was a clear guidance, Allah's own speech dictated unchanged for 1400 years so that's the quran was like a, a, a corrective but needless to say i began to fall in love with the bible and i always looked for islamic traditions that would conform to the bible in this respect so that was the, that was a major shift um and then i met somebody who was sort of i would say a, a protege of this of this nation of islam scholar and I started connecting with him. And, you know, we, 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 we exchanged conversations about uh, these topics, about the theophany of God in, in, the, in the scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures, and in Islam, and how, you know, modern day Muslims just don't get it. They've missed the boat. They're, they have this jewel in their own tradition, and they're neglecting it or pretending it doesn't exist or it's fabricated or what have you. So I remember one day we were talking about that tradition about uh, God appearing to Muhammad as a young man. And I, I found it interesting because the the age of that man is supposed to be 30 to 33, right? And I'm thinking, well, <clears throat> that's interesting because Jesus, you know, he was around 30, 33. And then that's when he dropped the bomb on me because I said, you know, those those Christians, they they believe that Jesus is that man or whatever, or Jesus is is God. And I and I kind of laughed it off. And he said, Well, that's the divine Christ that appeared to Muhammad. And I said, What? You got to be kidding. And then he began to expound to me how basically, even though Muslims deny the Trinity, deny the divinity of Christ, mm -hmm. deny the crucifixion, it doesn't matter because the, you, can, you can understand and should understand the Quran in light of previous revelation without negating its truth. So then I began to read and understand and interpret the Quran through a Christocentric lens. So, for example, the crucifixion, where it says in Surah An-Nisa, the fourth chapter of the Quran, verses around 156 to 157, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, they say we killed Allah's Messiah, the son of Mary, nay, they killed him not nor crucified him. God is exalted in power and wise and Allah raised him up to himself, right? This kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So an, an ordinary Muslim would interpret that as well. Yeah, they, they, they didn't really crucify him. He didn't die. Somehow, whether it was the substitution theory or the swoon theory, somehow God saved his Messiah from death and, and took, took him body and soul into heaven from whence he will return. But they didn't kill him. And I say, no, they didn't kill him in the sense that they had a victory over him. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. He was still victorious. He rose victoriously. And uh, the proof text was, uh, you know, oh, Jesus and another surah, Surat al-Imran, the third chapter. 
I will cause you to, some translations say, I will cause you to die, Mutawafika, and I will raise you to myself, right? So I'm thinking, okay, well, there it says God is going to cause him to die, right? Not the Jews or the Romans. They can't, they can't take credit for this thing. It's God's plan. It's God's master plan. He will cause him to die mm -hmm. as a sacrificial lamb and then raise him to himself. And interestingly enough, you, you, could, you could also interpret raising in terms, not only body and soul, but rank. So Jesus is given the name above every name, oh, right? Yeah. Which would be, which would be <laughs> Yahweh, which would be Allah. So Allah gave him his own name, right? So this is how I was interpreting things. And um, I was in this stage to various degrees for a few years. And, but, but funny enough, it, even though I was in, I was in the wrong place, if you have a door cracked open and you allow some light to get in, that light is going to get stronger and stronger until eventually the shadows vanish. And so mm -hmm. that's how I, I, that's how I would describe the remainder of my journey from this point. So, so really quick, right? You're baptized Catholic, you grow up Protestant, then you become Muslim, but then you enter now into this face of what we called Chrislam, right? So yeah. a very Christocentric kind of Islam, um, one that most mainstream Muslims will not recognize at all as valid or, you know, oh, absolutely. Continuation, right? Absolutely. And so, I mean, how did you feel at the time? Because you went from kind of going, you know, like, you know, you've had these experiences where you convert and go against your com original community, and then now you're doing it again. So, like, you know, how did people react? How did you feel during this whole process? I mean, was it scary for you to once again be on the margins and the outside of the mainstream of what community you were a part of? Yeah. Um, at first, but I became so engrossed in the person of Christ and relationship with him. I mean, I'll never forget when I, when it finally hit me that, you know, basically the, the, uh, the manifest God of the Quran is the logos who became incarnate in Jesus. Then I started pouring over the new Testament and my gosh, well, I never read this stuff before. It's so beautiful. It's so powerful. It's it's transformative, right? And the, the greatest thing was when I discovered from a very, because I was, at this point, I had uh, imbibed Protestant authors. So I listened to people like, you know, Charles Stanley or um, A.W. Tozer, people like this, right? And the whole thing, the whole ethos of being free in Christ and what that means as a Protestant, uh, you're free from the old law, meaning not just the sacrificial system of the OT, but law in general. I mean, religious law. You don't have to do that ritual stuff that, you know, none of that stuff. You're free. The chains are gone now. Now you can just have a, a free flowing relationship with the Father through the Son in the Spirit and nothing can hold you back. You can just converse with God anytime you want, how you want. You don't have to do the five daily prayers. You don't have to fast if you don't want to. If you feel compelled to fast and you wake up one day, you do it, but not out of obligation. Uh, you're free from that. Your salvation is secure. Yeah. Can um, I can I just uh, kind of focus on this point? Because I think it's something worth mentioning, right? Because for a lot of Protestants, when they view the Catholic Church, they see rituals, they see religious uh -huh. laws, and they see kind of um, kind of this restricted kind of intimacy with God. Whereas yeah. for a lot of Protestants who don't, quote unquote, have this institutional um, weight, so to speak, mm -hmm. they feel like they're more free to just love God and pour yeah. themselves out to him. They don't need to go through Mary and the saints or, you know, all that, all that stuff, yeah, right? For sure. So you for kind sure. of adopted that yourself in your own life at that point. I did. Yeah, I yeah. did. And um, so that was my walk for a few years and I felt very secure. And, there, and when I would go to the mosque occasionally, I was afraid because I'm like, well, I'm sure word might have gotten around in the community to some degree that I'm holding this view and I'm scared kind of nervous. I mean, I wasn't, don't, don't get me wrong. I wasn't afraid for my life or anything, but just, just like being confronted, confronted or ostracized or, or rejected. Right. Uh, even though I wasn't really a part of this community um, in, in a major way anymore, I still, you know, like to go to the mosque occasionally and see my brothers and whatever. Um, but the more I 
in, the more I engrossed myself in, in Christ and in life in Christ and the New Testament, and the less I became attached to the rituals of Islam, uh, I got to the point where I'm like, I, I'm just going to live as a, a free Christian. Like, yeah, I'll believe Muhammad is a prophet and, you know, maybe the rituals were binding for his immediate followers, but hey, I, I'm good. Like, I know what I need to do. I know how God wants me to, to walk this thing out. And so I had been going to a church with my, with my dad and uh, I was on fire for Christ. So, I mean, I, I wanted to be involved in this community, right? And uh, I talked to the pastor who's very understanding. I said, look, this is my view. Can I, can I, do you mind if having me here? And he said, no, not at all. You're, you're welcome here. And so I did find a community. It wasn't a Muslim community, but it was a community and it was, it was centered on Christ. So gradually I just, I started shedding the Islamic barnacles more and more. I began to volunteer at the church. I started cleaning the bathrooms. Like I, I, I was so just in love with Christ and his people. Like I, I wanted to do anything I could to serve. So cleaning the bathrooms. Then I, um, was editing for one of their magazines. Then I was uh, editing the audio and video for Sunday sermons to go online. Like I, I basically lived at this place, right? And I was just so like, I was so happy. And uh, I was, you know, my close with my family. And uh, so that's how it that's how it was. Um, so your your mom and dad, they they were they must have been really happy then that you you returned to Christianity, right? I mean, um, and so it sounds like you had a kind of reunion with them, right? I did. In fact, I ended up getting, well, to, to, to the pastor's credit, I wanted to get rebaptized because I didn't think my first baptism was, was, was valid. So he said to me, excuse me, he said, Dustin, we're not going to rebaptize you because you've already been baptized. So, you know, good pre Presbyterian accepted the Trinitarian baptism. He said, we're going to rededicate you. So we'll do the we'll do the immersion, but we won't say that you're getting baptized. We'll say that you're rededicating your life to Christ. And that that was 2012, and um, I ended up doing that. And from that point on, I was basically that any ties I had to Islam was basically like lip service in certain con uh, certain companies, certain conversations, to sort of bring people to Christ more, rather than. I'm dead set on this conviction and it, it means something for my life practically or otherwise. I just, I started just walking away from that more and more. Now, the, the real breaking point for me was oddly enough, you know, we Catholics make a big deal out of communion. Yeah. Well, it was communion thinking about communion that got me to finally rid myself of Islam and how that went down is this even though i saw communion as symbolic at the time so it was nothing about the real presence but it was the sheer fact and gravity of our lord jesus christ saying this is my commandment do this in memory of me and saint paul says elsewhere when we eat this bread and drink this cup we proclaim his death until he comes again so in terms of Paul's understanding, this ritual is supposed to be repeated until the Perusia, until Christ's second coming. Interesting, because here comes Muhammad. Where's the Eucharist? Where did it go, Muhammad? If, if Christ, by my own Akida, by my own creed, is God in the flesh, he already came and gave us the fullness of who he is and what he expects from us. So who is a 7th century prophet to reverse the Sharia, the, the religious law of God incarnate? Where's the Eucharist in Islam? It's nowhere. But more than that, did you know, and you probably do, it, your viewers might not, uh, to drink wine in any shape, form, or fashion in Islam is haram. It's forbidden and it's a serious sin there are hadith that say among those of the people of hellfire are those who drink wine so if i'm to be loyal to god incarnate 
God who walked the earth, and he commands me to eat bread and drink wine in remembrance of his death. If I do the very thing that God incarnate asked me to do, I am sinning so that I'll end up in hell by Islam standards. So who wins? God wins. God is the higher authority. So how, how dare you call something so sacred, established by God himself, something that would lead me to hell if I were to participate in it, whether or not I believed in the real presence. So that was enough for me to say, you know what? This thing is not of God. Yes, there is truth in it. There's truth in all religions, but it's by virtue of Christ shining his rays of light in grades and degrees in other religions, other paths to ultimately draw men into the fullness. It's not that these are parallel paths to salvation on their own, mm -hmm. but that was it for me. Wow. <laughs> and from, from that point on, I decided that I'm going to follow Christ exclusively, no baggage. Let's go. So uh, that was that. And then, so at this point, I was attending a Presbyterian church. But then I got interested in, you know, what are the what are the doctrinal sort of definers of Presbyterianism? You know, what are they? What is this tradition exactly? So I started listening to guys like Paul Washer, John MacArthur. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some themes here. I'm seeing total depravity. I'm seeing the ultimate expression of humility. I'm dirt, right? We're dirt. God hates us. Outside of Christ, we're hated by God. So, but in, in Christ, we're... God loves us as he loves Christ and he doesn't see anything but Christ when he looks at us, if we're elect, mm -hmm. right? This kind of thing. So I'm like, wow, uh, this is like, this is, it, it's, it's the ultimate blow to the ego and the old Adam, but it's the ultimate exaltation in Christ. I'm like this, this, is this Presbyterianism? Is Presbyterianism Calvinism? So I'm like, yeah, this is the church I go to. Well, how come I don't hear any sermons about total depravity, about God hating sinners, about limited atonement, about perseverance of the saints and right. mm -hmm. all this stuff, right? So I'm like, maybe this church is just not orthodox enough. <laughs> so I, I, I tell my wife, I say, we need to find another church. And I went to this Baptist church, uh, a little ways away it was a little white like you see on the on the tv sometimes it's that little yeah. white house looking thing right and i met with the pastor for about three hours wow talking and about theology talk about theology <laughs> and he's like man i love paul washer i love john macarthur da, da, da. so i'm like this is it i'm home right but he he said something that unsettled me just a little bit but it was just enough in god's mm. providence right mm. he says i said well you know i've been i've been hearing about these early church fathers right and I, because I saw this YouTube video about Calvinism and the fathers, and it was, it was gotcha quotes. It was yeah. quote mining, showing how St. Augustine was a Calvinist on all of the five points of Tulip. So I'm like, well, I, I searched Google pastor and, and I see that some of these guys taught like free will mm -hmm. and, and salvation of, of all through the cross. I don't see limited atonement in the fathers. He's like, well, that's easy. If they disagree with scripture, you ignore them. I said, okay, fair enough. Yeah, right? It's sola scriptura anyway. That, that's the ticket. So yeah, they must be just wrong on that point. Whatever. I'll just ignore them. I'll listen to Luther. I'll listen to Paul. <laughs> it's good enough for me, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I get home. I tell my wife, like, okay, next Sunday, I said, I, I got to work midnight. So I won't be able to make it. But you gotta you gotta go and report back to me. Let me know how the worship is. Let me know is the music old fashioned hymns? Is it solemn? Is it is the is it you know expository preaching? Is it hellfire and brimstone? And <laughs> if it is, this is what this is our church. Okay, so you go and, and you you go hun and you tell me, uh, and then we'll we'll see where it leads. Funny enough, I uh, I was headed to uh, uh, the the following Sunday. I went to my, my regular church and I was walking 
inside the vestibule, but I tripped on the carpet and hit my head. Oh man. And, uh, yeah, so they, they checked me out because I, I guess I blacked out for a few seconds and I was just shook up and it, the day was a wash. So for some reason, I never, never went back to that church. I never stepped foot in it hmm. because now I, I'm by myself and I, I can't, I can't ignore this, this church father stuff, right? So I'm, I'm getting ready to move out of my, my parents' house, get in my own house for the first time with my wife and, uh. All I have is a mattress in my room. I'm laying on the floor and it's like 3 a.m. I got my phone in my hand. I'm on this this thing called Catholic Answers. And I'm like, what, the, what the heck, man? What is this? These forums. And I'm just like, I'm just scouring through this stuff. I'm sweating. I'm panicking. I'm like, uh, what is this? Like, I, this can't be true, can it? So then uh, I, I'm wrestling with myself. One of my friends tells me to watch a debate between James White, who was my then hero, and this guy called Tim Staples mm. on Sola Scriptura. And uh, so I'm watching the debate. And of course, I'm going for James White and I'm, I'm rooting for him and this and that. But I, in, my, in my head, in my heart, I know that this Tim Staples fella has got some pretty good arguments and some pretty good evidence. <laughs> like I, I've never seen, I've never seen, cause I, I didn't know many Catholics myself. Right. But all I, what I, what I thought of them is what I heard from anti-Catholics. Yeah. Like these people don't love Christ. They're in a dead religion. They're, they're going to hell. They're, they're false Christians. But here's Tim Staples talking about his love for Christ. And you know, this, this, these things called, ecumenical councils and, and and all this stuff i'm like wow this is crazy so uh, the, over the next several months i'm just imbibing this stuff and i'm i get to the i get to the crossroads and i and i say god you know i i'll go anywhere but don't make me go here like this is too much <laughs> like you got to understand what i thought about the catholic church because i was seeing a, a, a herbalist i used to be big into like you know, healthy eating and tinctures and, and I was anti-vax and, and yeah, uh, all that, yeah. Mm-hmm. but at the, at the heart of all these conspiracies was the Catholic church. So the Catholic church was, <laughs> was, <clears throat> was behind chemtrails, was behind GMOs, uh, was the new world order. They sacrificed babies to Lucifer under the catacombs, like all this crap. Right. And I, I, I literally believe this like wholeheartedly like the Jack Chick stuff, like they had like this supercomputer with the names of the true Christians in it, and they were going to kill us all. Uh, I really believe this stuff. So I was really hesitant to uh, attach myself to this community. But for the sake of truth, as I had done many times before, yeah, right, I, I counted the cost. And I said, you know, as Paul said, I count everything as rubbish, or dung, that I may gain Christ. And I came to the understanding and the conviction that the fullness of the means of salvation, the fullness of the gospel lay in the one true church established by our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the one Holy Catholic and apostolic church founded on the rock of Peter. And so I made an act of faith in 2014. I believed all that the Catholic church teaches to be revealed by God. And in 2015, my wife and I entered full communion with the Catholic church and it's uh, going on seven years. So wow. I've been Catholic only second. I've, I've been Muslim long, like a practicing yeah. religious mm-hmm. person. My longest stint was Islam, but really it, it was eight years. Right. But m- some of those years I was actually living as a Christian. So really I've been a practicing Catholic longer than I have anything else in my life. And I'm almost Mm. 40. So it's amazing how, how time is flying by. Yeah. So like, um, and just to talk about your wife very briefly, you know, how did your wife react when you said that you wanted to become Catholic because she was there in your journey when you were Protestant, you know? And so she was aware of many of the same things that you talked about, right? Like the concerns you had about becoming Catholic. And so how does she react to all of this? Well, um, so first my wife she always kept me on the she always put lit the fire under me and and kept me straight so like (laughs) you know i i'm I'm pretty good at at talking and expounding on certain things and i can be i i people tell me at least i can be persuasive yeah Mm -hmm. so i i managed to 
at least I, I think persuade some people of my Christocentric Islamic views that they were, you know, oh, he must have something there, you know? And I tried that on my wife. Mm -hmm. and she's like, nah, nah, <laughs> it, that's that, that ain't, that ain't, they, that ain't it, she, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I would get so frustrated with her because I'm like, come on, like, why can't you see this? So it, it, it kept me in line. But much like her, much like myself, she didn't have a high opinion of Catholicism, but she didn't know much about it either, uh, mm -hmm. like myself. And when I was searching for the, you know, the first several months, I, I kept it to myself because I was afraid to tell her. Mm -hmm. um, the, and so when I finally did, she uh, said, you know, I, I don't know you. You're a stranger to me. Mm -hmm. And we had just gotten married. So... Um, yeah, we, we met in um, October of 2013, and we got married by February 2014. Mm -hmm. And we've been married seven years. Um, so this is uh, right around the time I became Catholic. Uh, like I was Protestant for a short time when she knew me, or Chrislam or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she she said, you're a stranger to me. I didn't marry a Catholic. I'm not doing this. Like you, you can't, you're not doing this. I, it, it, it got so bad mm -hmm. to where she's like, I, I don't want to be with someone like this. Like you, you were supposed to be consistent and you're supposed to be solid. And right. here, mm -hmm. here you are flaking off and doing this thing. And I don't even know who you are. Like it got, it got scary. So, um, at first I was trying to give her, you know, the whole apologetics approach. Yeah. And she just didn't want to hear it. Like sh it was really contentious and uh, really stressful. So I got counsel from my then, you know, spiritual father, my, my priest that I would confess to. And, and I was at his parish and he would say, you know, you just need to learn to be quiet. <laughs> right. And, and mm -hmm. that was hard for me. Right. Just, just be quiet for a while. Show her through your actions. Show her how you know coming to mass, you know coming to mass in this, is helping you and be a better person. And let her see it. So for a while, um, I just didn't say much. Um, but um, one night after there was a, I had a Christmas banquet thing for my job, and she went we went together it was like a date night and then after we got home she just said to me how do i know the bible's the word of god like how do i know that the books that are in there are supposed to be in there hmm. she just she just came out of nowhere and asked me and i was caught off guard because i'm like i was waiting for so long to be able to talk about this stuff candidly with her yeah. where she wanted to hear something right and and this was the first time that she let me in so then I started talking about how, you know, the, the Catholic Bible is bigger for X, Y, and Z reasons. And Martin Luther and the subsequent reformers did this. What gave them the authority? Who are they? And then slowly but surely, the walls start coming down. Mm. She starts coming to Mass. We read Rome Sweet Home together. Um, it was nice because I, I would read Scott's parts and she would read Kimberly's parts. Oh, that's beautiful, yeah. And a lot of stuff that they were describing in the book, like how Scott was afraid of Kimberly's reaction and Kimberly feeling like left alone and, and depressed. Like she could, my wife could relate to that. Mm -hmm. And you know what the funny thing is, is um, we got to the part about contraception. Mm -hmm. And, you know, up to that point, we weren't ready to have kids. So we were just doing the, the contraception thing. But once we read what Scott and Kimberly had to say about that and the Catholic teaching, we stopped doing that. Mm. So in a, in a, in a way I, I can thank Christ church for giving me three beautiful daughters that I have today, mm. because if I was, if it was left up to me and my desires and my lack of knowledge, then I, uh, who knows, I might, it might just be us two today. Like, I, I don't know, but it's because of the church's teaching that is in, in accord with faith and reason, Yeah, you know, that 
it opened up a whole new world. And I'm like, wow, this is what this is what the marital act is for. This is, you know, natural law, uh, the ends, the telos of things, you mm -hmm. know, why we have certain reproductive parts, it's for certain ends, that's why they're designed the way that they are, and so on. And, you know, it just made perfect sense. So I'm like, yeah, I, we can't do that anymore. Like, and she agreed, like, this is this is not right. And so, you know, we just start implementing things and, and, and aligning ourselves as we learn more with the teaching of the church. And um, the by the time I, I told the, the priest, like, we want to come in, uh, RCIA was almost over. Mm. He's like, well, you don't need that. You know, you're good. Like, don't worry. He's like, you, <laughs> you know enough that you could come in. But he's like, when it starts up next year, he's like, just come for the the experience, come for the community, talk to people, you know, this and that. And so we, we came in in 2015 and it's funny because the second episode of my podcast my wife actually does the episode with me she she sat beside me and spoke into the into the mic mm -hmm. this was the early days of my setup when it was just audio um but she uh we we the the, the title of the episode was how our marriage almost went up in smoke right and that's <laughs> that's very uh appropriate but, right. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's been great. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm the, I'm the intellectual heady side sometimes, or oftentimes I drive myself crazy. I overanalyze things. Um, but she has a simple faith to counterbalance me mm. and she is rock solid. She's stable. Um, so we, we compliment each other beautifully and, uh, she is my Proverbs 31 woman. And I know, Tanya, you're going to be watching this. I love you. Thank you for putting up with all my crap. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you one last question, Dustin, and then we can, I think we can, we can wrap up. So here's my question to you. Yeah. You know, someone might say, Dustin, how do you know that you have found the truth now? Okay, because you've gone through multiple experiences in your life, or you've gone from one background, or uh, one religious tradition to another. If someone asks you, how do you know, Dustin, that you've now found the truth? And how can you help someone who is also trying to discern whether or not to become Catholic? What, what, what would you tell them? That's a great question. Um, yeah, because someone could say, well, you probably thought you had the truth when you were at all these different junctures. Mm. So, so why is this pit stop any different? This is probably just a pit stop. Where are you going to end up six months from now? Right, yeah. Um, well, I would say... Once it is established that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, he can't lie because God can't lie, and God is not weak. And if you read Matthew 16, Christ says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he says, elsewhere I will be with you always, even until the end of the age, and, um, you know, stuff like this. And so I would say, if Jesus is who he says he is, he also does what he says he would do. So if God is is God, if Christ is God, and God builds a church or a community, and he promises divine assistance to remain with this community until he comes to redeem his bride in the, full, in the second coming, then we can trust him and come hell or high water. It's not our duty to question this, question whether he told the truth or can keep his promises, but it's our duty to cling to the cross amidst any scandal, any um, subjective feelings, any personal struggles that we have, we can lean on Christ and we could be at peace in the, in the house of God that he established for our salvation. And what I would say to somebody is the beautiful thing about Catholicism, and you could go to my channel for this, for more on this, Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. 
You can find me on YouTube. So if you type in Dustin Quick, Holy Smokes, then my episodes and channel will come up. You can also go to my channel directly, which is www.youtube.com slash E truth one, the number one. Um, and again, it shows how Catholicism is the fulfillment, the full flowering of the biblical religion. So, you know, everything from the papacy to the Eucharist, to the priesthood, to Mariology, to Marian devotion, all of this stuff is rooted in the temple, which is a microcosm of the creation itself. So this is this is the religion, this is the way, this is the pattern that God has established for the salvation and the glorification of the cosmos. And look, if you're Christian, God wants to give you the fullness of his life on earth. And the means that he's established to, for this end is his church, is his body. The head works through his body, right? We And it's one body. We can't say... Like, we can't look at our bride and say, oh, I love your face, but I hate your body. No, it's it's one person, right? The whole Christ, as St. Augustine says, totus Christus is the head and the body together. So Christ's body, that's where the graces come from. And his, his visible body on earth, he gives us the sacraments through his priests who stand in his person with his authority. So the Eucharist, uh, confession, baptism, confirmation or chrismation, all these are... Uh, their vehicles or vessels through which God infuses his divine life in us so that we experience a foretaste of heaven here and now. We don't have to wait till the by and by until we're, until we're, we're dead to experience paradise. We can experience theosis or divinization or deification now on earth, and the fullness thereof will be revealed in the beatific vision and the resurrection of our Lord. And the sure way to be with God for all eternity in heaven is to obey him. And he has established this church and he has commanded that all enter in. Now, of course, not everybody is, that's objectively speaking, not everybody is going to find their way. There may be mitigating circumstances or whatever the case may be. God is merciful and he is not bound by his sacraments so that he, he may decide to save people in an extraordinary way outside of the visible bounds of his church. But when you come in face to face with the truth that God established the Catholic church, then it is incumbent upon you to investigate the claims of the church. And the greatest thing is, is that we hide nothing. So if, if this was a scam, if this was a cult, you would expect us to try to cover up the worst parts of our history and only make ourselves look good. But the books are open. This 2000 year book is open. We've got this, we've got the worst scoundrels, the worst sins, the worst sinners. We've also got the greatest saints, you know? So at the end of the day, this is it. This is where the buck stops. For me, it's Catholicism or nothing. Um, because again, I see in it the fullness of the biblical religion right up to the papacy. And I would say the closest the closest contender is the East, our Eastern Orthodox brethren. However, they lack the universal jurisdiction of the royal vizier of the king uh, the king of Judah, which is what we have. Uh, you know, the papacy really is the fulfillment of a, a, a Isaiah twenty two. It's not a Roman invention. It's not a Greco Roman Senate pattern. It's it's biblical. So the Catholic Church has the fullness of the means of salvation. It has Christ's hierarchy on earth to guide us, to shepherd us, to give us his grace. And we have brothers and sisters in the Lord who have gone before us to intercede for us, especially the most holy, all holy, immaculate mother of God who bore Christ. So if she's the one who gives Christ to the world, she brings the world back to Christ through her maternal care and intercession. And so we seek her intercession. We love her because Christ loved her and honor your father and mother. No one did that better than Christ. So he's going to honor our, his mother by giving us to her and her to us to bring us to him. And, and that's it. So uh, Catholicism, man, it's, it's the, even though, look, even though we live in a, in a difficult time, there's divisions in the church. We know what the church teaches. We know where her shepherds are and we know who to remain in communion with. And we know not to go into schism 
or apostatize and we endure to the end so that we may be saved. Wow, Dustin, that was a great answer. And so thank you so much for coming out to my show and talking about your story. It's really inspiring, man. And so I really hope that you'll be able to go on to, you know, Pints of Aquinas and other places, Dustin, you have a story worth sharing. And so, man, thank you so much. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, being so gracious with your time and uh, for all the work that you do. Keep up the good work. All right. Thank you, Dustin. All right. God bless, man.